I'm Jim and I've been a trucker for 22 years now, and the youngest of five kids. I only say that because it means I don't get rattled easily. My wife Sarah and I live in a small town in Georgia, near where I grew up, with our two dogs. We're simple folk, just trying to get by and maybe save a little for our golden years. Honestly, my goal in life is just to spend my days on my back porch, with not a care in the world. Last month, I was on a routine run from Tampa to Atlanta. It was a quiet Tuesday night, around 1.15 a.m., when I hit that long stretch of I-75 north of Ocala. The road was empty, just me and the occasional pair of headlights in the distance. I'd been driving for hours, and my eyes were getting heavy. I decided to pull over at the next rest stop to grab some coffee and splash some water on my face. Normally that's something I can do with my eyes closed, so to speak. But on that day, that's when things got weird. As I approached mile marker 368, my truck's engine started to sputter. The dashboard lights flickered, and then everything went dark. I coasted to the shoulder, completely powerless. I'd never had anything like this happen before. Great, I muttered, reaching for my phone to call for help. But my phone was dead too. So was my backup battery pack. It didn't make any sense, but I wasn't worried. At least, not yet. I sat there for a few minutes, trying to figure out what to do next. I rolled my window down and that's when I noticed how quiet it was. No crickets, no frogs, not even the sound of wind in the trees. It made me think of how my dad described his days in Nam. Feeling uneasy, I grabbed my flashlight from the glove box and stepped out of the cab. The air felt thick and heavy, like right before a big storm. But the sky was clear, stars twinkling overhead. I popped the hood and started checking the engine, even though I knew it was pointless. Whatever was wrong, it wasn't something I could fix on the side of the road. As I leaned over the engine, I heard a soft thud behind me. I turned around slowly, my flashlight beam cutting through the darkness, and that's when I saw it. About 50 feet away, standing at the edge of the tree line was something. It was tall, maybe eight or nine feet, but thin as a rail. Its skin looked like old tree bark, all gnarled and twisted. But the weirdest part was its shape. It had too many limbs, all bent at odd angles like a praying mantis. I stood there as I watched this thing slowly unfolded itself. Its head, if you could call it that, was just a smooth, featureless bump on top of a long, writhing neck. My flashlight beam caught its eyes, three of them arranged in a triangle. They glowed a dull red, like dying embers. As it looked at me, I swear to you, I felt a pressure building in my head, like someone was squeezing my brain. The creature took a step forward, moving in a way that made my stomach turn. It was all wrong, like watching a film played backward and in slow motion. I wanted to run, to jump back in my truck and lock the doors, but I couldn't move. It wasn't fear holding me in place. It was like my body had forgotten how to work. The thing kept coming closer, one jerky step at a time. With each step, the pressure in my head got worse. My vision started to blur, and I could taste copper in the back of my throat. When it was about 20 feet away, it stopped. A low humming filled the air, vibrating in my chest. The creature's body began to shift and change, like smoke trying to hold a shape in the wind. One of its limbs stretched out towards me, growing longer and longer. I could see now that it ended not in a hand, but in something that looked like a cluster of thin, writhing tentacles. All I could think was that I was hallucinating for some reason. Just as those tentacles were about to touch me, a car horn blared in the distance. The creature's head snapped around, and in the blink of an eye, it was gone. Not like it ran away. One second it was there, and the next it just wasn't. The moment it vanished, everything came back to life. My truck's engine roared to life, crickets started chirping, and I could move again. I didn't waste any time. I jumped in my truck and drove off, my hands shaking on the wheel. I told my wife all about it, and she totally believes me. She knows me well, and I wouldn't make this crap up. I'm not crazy, and I wasn't dreaming. Something impossible happened out there on I-75, and I need to know if anyone else has seen it. Has anyone encountered anything like this near Ocala or anywhere else? I can't be the only one who's seen this thing, can I? Please make a comment if you know anything.
Jason Reeves never thought he'd end up in Alaska. After three tours in Afghanistan, he'd seen enough action to last a lifetime. But when the nightmares became too much, and the bustle of city life too overwhelming, he found himself drawn to the vast wilderness of Denali National Park. There was something about the rugged landscape that soothed his battle-worn soul. Five years into his job as a park ranger, Jason had settled into a comfortable routine. He spent his days patrolling the backcountry, assisting lost hikers, and occasionally dealing with overzealous wildlife photographers. The quiet life suited him, and he'd almost managed to forget the adrenaline rush of his military days. That all changed on a crisp autumn morning in late September. Jason was doing a routine check of a remote area when he came across something that made him pause. There, in a patch of soft mud near a mountain stream, was a set of tracks unlike anything he'd ever seen before. At first glance, they resembled bear prints, but as Jason crouched down for a closer look, he realized they were far too large. The shape was off too, not quite animal, not quite human. He got down low and studied the impressions, his mind struggling to make sense of what he was seeing. Jason snapped a few photos with his phone, which also marked the GPS location. He tried to convince himself it was probably just a deformed bear print, maybe even a hoax left by some mischievous hikers. But deep down, he was concerned. Something about those tracks stirred up old instincts he thought he'd left behind in the dust of Kandahar. As the days grew shorter and the first snows began to dust the peaks of Denali, Jason found himself returning to that remote spot again and again. He even reached out to an old army buddy who was into this kind of stuff but no one could offer a satisfactory explanation for what he'd found. Meanwhile, strange occurrences began to pile up around the park. Campers reported eerie howls echoing through the valleys at night. Jason didn't tell them, but the sounds were too deep and resonant to be wolves. A seasoned hiker swore he saw a massive shadowy figure loping across a distant ridge in the twilight hours. And then there were the livestock mutilations on the outskirts of the park animals torn apart with an almost surgical precision. Jason's colleague's thoughts were that it was just natural predators, but he couldn't shake the nagging feeling that something else was out there, something that didn't fit neatly into the natural order of things. As winter settled over Denali, bringing with it long nights and brutal cold, Jason found himself volunteering for more and more backcountry patrols. His fellow rangers exchanged worried glances, whispering about PTSD and the toll it might be taking on him. But Jason didn't care. He was determined to find answers, even if it meant facing the harsh Alaskan winter alone. One particularly frigid evening, as he was setting up camp near the site where he'd first discovered the tracks, Jason heard a twig snap in the darkness beyond his firelight. He froze, his hand instinctively reaching for the rifle at his side, thinking this was it. The silence that followed was deafening, broken only by the crackle of his fire. And then, just on the edge of his hearing, a low rumbling growl started to swell. In that moment, as fear threatened to overwhelm him, Jason realized he had a choice to make, and only a few moments to make it. He could retreat to safety and dismiss the whole thing, or he could press on, hopefully uncovering the truth. Jason made his choice. Whatever was out there, whatever was stalking around in Denali, he was determined to face it head on, but with that decision, the growling stopped. Sleep eluded him that night as he strained his ears for any sign of the creature's return. At the first light of dawn, he packed up camp and set out to follow the fresh tracks that had appeared overnight. The trail led him deeper into the wilderness, winding through spruce forests and across frozen streams. By midday, he found himself at the mouth of a cave half hidden by a stand of gnarled black spruce. The tracks led straight inside. This was it, he thought. Jason hesitated at the entrance, his flashlight beam disappearing into the darkness beyond. But he knew that if he left now, he might never get another chance to solve this mystery. Taking a deep breath, he stepped into the cave. The air was thick with the musty smell of animal fur and something else, something he couldn't quite place. As he moved deeper into the cavern, his light caught something reflective on the ground. Bending down, he realized it was a military-grade tracking device, 
smashed to pieces. Before he could process what this might mean, a low growl echoed through the cave. Jason whirled around, his flashlight beam catching a pair of glowing eyes in the darkness. For a moment, time seemed to stand still as he locked gazes with the creature. It was massive, easily eight feet tall, with a body covered in thick, matted fur. Its face made Jason's blood run cold. It was almost human-like, with a flattened nose and a protruding brow, but there was a look to its eyes that freaked him out, like looking into the eyes of an ape. The creature let out a roar that literally shook loose stones from the cave ceiling. Jason stumbled backward, fumbling for his rifle, but before he could raise it, the beast was upon him. Its enormous hand swatted the weapon away as if it were a toy. Jason found himself pinned against the cave wall, staring into the creature's face. This close, he could smell its hot, rancid breath. He closed his eyes, certain that his life was about to end, but the blow never came. Instead, the creature leaned in close, its nose twitching as it sniffed him. Then, to Jason's utter astonishment, he thinks he heard it speak. Go, it growled. With that, the creature released him by shoving him towards the entrance and lumbered back into the darkness. Jason didn't need to be told twice. He scrambled to his feet, snatched up his rifle, and ran from the cave as fast as his legs could carry him. He didn't stop running until he reached his truck, parked miles away at the trailhead. As he sped back towards civilization, his mind reeled from what he had experienced, a creature that shouldn't exist, a creature that could speak. In the days that followed, Jason debated whether to report what he had seen. In the end, he decided against it. It would become chaos if people found out about it. And what would happen to the creature if the wrong people found out about it? Instead, he requested to be assigned a new patrol and gave up that remote section as if it had never happened. As he settled into his new routine, Jason tried to convince himself that it had all been altered reality, a PTSD he was still processing. But deep down, he knew the truth. Jason still finds himself thinking about the creature. He hopes it is still out there, still hidden from the world, but he also prays that he will never, ever encounter it again. As the sun dipped below the horizon in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, Robert Kleber sat hunched over his computer in the dimly lit ranger station. His eyes, bloodshot from hours of staring online readings, darted back and forth across the screen. Something wasn't right. Robert had been a ranger at the park for over a decade, and he prided himself on his intimate knowledge of Kilauea's rhythms and moods. But the data before him defied explanation. The seismic activity he was observing didn't match any patterns he'd seen before. Not those associated with magma movement, not with tectonic shifts, not even with the occasional deep tremors that sometimes rippled through the island chain. He leaned back in his chair, rubbing his temples as he tried to make sense of it all. The tremors were deep, far deeper than typical volcanic activity, and they were moving, not in the familiar upward path of rising magma, but laterally, as if something was crawling through the Earth's crust. Robert shook his head, trying to dispel the ridiculous notion. He was a man of science, not fantasy. There had to be a logical explanation. As he reached for his mug of now cold coffee, a low rumble shook the station. Coffee sloshed over the rim, spattering across his desk. Robert froze, his hands still outstretched, as he felt the vibrations intensify. This was no ordinary earthquake. The tremors crescendoed, and Robert could have sworn he heard something else beneath the rumble. A sound so low and vast it was more felt than heard. Robert then sat in stunned silence for a moment before springing into action. He needed to check the sensors scattered across the park to gather more data. If this was some new type of volcanic activity, he had to understand it to assess any potential danger to the island and its inhabitants. Robert grabbed his gear and rushed out to his jeep. As he drove along the winding park roads, his headlights cutting through the darkness, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was fundamentally wrong. This type of thing should never happen, especially without warning from the many sensors they had placed. 
At the first sensor station, Robert's fears were confirmed. The readings were off the charts, showing seismic activity at depths he'd never seen before. As he downloaded the data onto his tablet, he felt the ground beneath his feet begin to tremble again. This time, Robert was certain he wasn't imagining things. The groaning sound was back, louder now. The trees around him swayed, their leaves rustling in a wind that wasn't there. Panic began to set in as Robert realized he was dealing with something far beyond his experience or understanding. Normal volcanic activity he could handle. This, not so much. He fumbled with his radio, desperate to call for backup, to warn someone, anyone, about what was happening. But before he could make the call, the ground heaved beneath him. Robert lost his footing and fell hard, his tablet sliding away across the rocky soil. As he struggled to his knees, he saw something that made him shake. In the dim moonlight, the earth before him began to bulge upward, as if something massive was pushing against it from below. The bulge grew, the ground cracking and splitting as it rose to about five feet high. Robert watched in horror, just waiting to see what was happening. Then, with a sound like tearing fabric magnified a thousandfold, the bulge split open. Earth and rock burst in all directions, as something began to emerge from the hole. Robert's mind reeled. Here he was, an expert on the area, but having no idea what was going on. A strange, glistening form was rising from the newly opened hole in the ground. It was organic, that much was clear, but like no living thing Robert had ever seen or imagined. As more of the creature revealed itself, Robert could make out what looked like enormous tentacles, each as thick as an elephant trunk. They writhed and twisted, pulling the rest of the body from the earth. Robert's scientific mind, even in the grip of terror, tried to make sense of what he was witnessing. Was this some ancient creature that had lain dormant beneath the island for millennia? Some unknown species that dwelled in the planet's depths? Or something even more impossible? An alien being that had burrowed up from unimaginable depths? All of it, and none of it made sense to him. He knew he should run, should get in his jeep and drive as fast and as far as he could. But Robert found himself paralyzed as the creature continued its emergence. He was dimly aware that he was hyperventilating, his breath coming in short, sharp gasps. As the thing pulled itself further from the ground, Robert saw what he could only describe as eyes, dozens of them, glowing with a flickering light, swiveling in all directions. And then, all at once, they fixed on him. The creature's massive form continued to rise. And then one enormous tentacle began to reach towards Robert. At last, the spell of terror that had held Robert in place broke. He scrambled to his feet and ran in the opposite direction, driven by blind panic. Behind him, he could hear the sounds of the creature's movement, feel the ground shaking with each shift of its body. He tore through the underbrush, branches whipping at his face and arms as he fled. His lungs burned and his legs ached but fear propelled him forward. He didn't dare look back, convinced that at any moment he would feel the grip of an enormous tentacle around his body. Robert burst out of the trees onto one of the park's access roads. His Jeep sat where he had left it. Without hesitation, he leaped into the vehicle, fumbling with his keys before finally starting the engine. As he sped down the winding road, Robert's mind raced. Should he alert the authorities? The magnitude of what he had witnessed overwhelmed him, and he found himself driving not towards the ranger station, but towards his own home. Robert arrived at his small house on the outskirts of Volcano Village, his hands shaking as he unlocked the door. He stumbled inside, collapsed onto his couch, and sat there in stunned silence until the first rays of dawn began to creep through his windows. After a quick shower and a strong cup of coffee, Robert couldn't help himself and he drove back to the park. The morning was bright and clear, a stark contrast to the terrifying events of the night before. As he approached the area where he had encountered the creature, Robert's heart pounded in his chest. But when he arrived at the spot, he found nothing, nothing at all. The ground was completely undisturbed. There was no giant hole, no uprooted trees, no sign of the massive creature he had seen emerge from the depths. Robert's brow furrowed in confusion. He walked the area, 
searching for any evidence of the previous night's events. He found his tablet where he had dropped it. The screen cracked but still functional. The seismic data was there, showing the strange readings he had observed. But beyond that, there was no physical evidence of the creature's existence. Robert spent hours combing the area, growing increasingly frustrated and bewildered. How could something so massive leave no trace? He checked and rechecked his coordinates, certain he was in the right place. But the landscape remained stubbornly, infuriatingly normal. Robert finally gave up his search. He stood there, surrounded by the peaceful beauty of the park, and felt a profound sense of uncertainty wash over him. The readings on his tablet suggested otherwise, but without physical evidence, he knew no one would believe his story. Robert returned to his Jeep to collect himself. As he drove home, he grappled with what he should do next. Report the incident and risk being labeled a lunatic. Keep it to himself and always wonder, what do you think he should do?